It's March 1781, and the United States is in the midst of the American Revolution. In Mason, New Hampshire, a 14-year-old teenager named Samuel Wilson volunteers to do whatever he can to aid his newly founded country. One of the common attacks by the country's enemies was tampering with food sources. So the young man takes it upon himself to guard and package meat and cattle supplies. When the War of 1812 commences, that man again finds himself called to service. He's too old to fight, so instead, he leans into his expertise and becomes a supplier of food and meat to troops across the country. Eventually, he is designated as the chief meat inspector for the U.S. Army. He ensures that every young soldier is properly fed and nourished. Each barrel of food delivered is stamped with the initials EA-US. Troops from upstate New York know that Samuel Wilson is behind the inspection of every barrel and start to believe that the U.S. in the stamp refers to him. They mull it over. The S stands for Sam, but the U? Could it be Uncle? And with that, the legend of Uncle Sam is born. Over the decades, the legend takes on a life of its own and Uncle Sam becomes an iconic symbol for the country, right up there with the bald eagle, the Statue of Liberty, and the Liberty Bell. The image of him pointing with the tagline, I want you for the U.S. Army, is successfully used for U.S. Army recruiting for multiple generations, and just as important, becomes the personification of the relationship citizens have with their country. But times have changed, And today's younger generations have no idea who Uncle Sam was or what he represented. The newest emerging cohort, Generation Z, or those born between 1997 and 2012, are radically different from earlier generations. And this is the age group the Army and military are targeting, with mixed results. In today's episode, our hosts sit down with two men who are not only members of Gen Z, but who also provide perspective on how to make service more of an enticing option for their peers. First Lieutenant Charlie Curtis, a new Army recruiting operations officer, talks about his early experiences and expectations on the front lines of recruiting. And Marine Corps Second Lieutenant Matthew Weiss discusses why he left a successful business career to serve his country. His recently released book, We Don't Want You, Uncle Sam, analyzes 21 action items to make service more appealing to Gen Z. I'm Carrie varro Heikis, and I want you to know that this is Army Matters. Well, hello everyone, I'm Dan Daly co-host of the Army Matters Podcast Show, and I get the honor and privilege of having this wonderful man join me on every episode. I'm Lieutenant General Leslie Smith, and I'm proud to be here as your co-host with my buddy Dan. We spent a lot of time in the Pentagon, man. Yeah, we did. And now we spend a lot of time here at AUSA. Yeah. Do people think we like each other? Well, I hope we're giving that impression. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, Dan. Mm Mm-hmm. Do you remember the day you signed up for the Army? I absolutely remember it. Okay, I talk to us. Yeah. What, what was it? And I'll I, I follow you. Go ahead. What, what was it? What was it like? Yeah, I was, you know, I'm nervous and scared like any young kid. You know, I was still in 11th grade in high school. I, okay. But I knew it's what I wanted to do. And uh, at least that's what I thought. You know, not yeah. much uh, 16 to 17 year old kid can think about the future, what they know. But uh, I was confident that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a soldier. And so the delayed entry program, that means your mom had to sign you up? Yeah, I was underage. I was okay. uh, I was a juvenile. And uh, so I actually still have a copy of that contract. Wow. Where my mother and father had to sign me into the Army. That is so to, cool. I used to use that against them every time I got upset with them, saying, yeah. you, you made me do this. You made me. <laughs> <laughs> and, they and they're like, oh, yeah, well, you turned out okay. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I remember for me, it was, uh, did you have a RTC, junior RTC at your school? No. No, we, we did, did not. Yeah. Uh, and in the city in Atlanta, and my uh, senior army instructor was sitting down with me and said, hey, Cadet Smith, what are you thinking about doing next? Well, like, oh, I think I'm going to go to school, blah, blah, blah. You ever thought about joining the Georgia Army National Guard? 
And I said, what? What's that? And I think the rest was history because I listened to what he told me to do. And then I went to Georgia Southern and the rest is history. So let, let's jump right into it. You ready? Let's do it. Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, the reason why we're having this chat today, we have two people from the Generation Z who could talk about recruiting and service in general. Dan, do you know what generation you're from? I think I'm the Pepsi generation. Okay. Is that a, is that a generation? No, I think that's a slang not. term from no. for the generation of which I'm from. Right. right. I'm the back end of the baby boomers, but I think I'm the front end of the, what's, I forget what it's called. The Pepsi generation. Generation X. Okay, there you go. Generation go. X. Yeah, okay. yeah. But but it, it was in the 80s. Yeah, they yeah. called us the Pepsi generation. Yeah. So joining us all the way from Australia, yes, Australia, is Marine Corps Lieutenant, Second Lieutenant, and author Matthew Weiss. Matthew, welcome to the show, brother. Gentlemen, thank you so much for having me. We're glad you're here. Yeah. Semper Fi to you, Marine. Semper Fi. Semper Fi. Hoorah. And ladies and gentlemen, our second guest on the show from the cold climate of Sarasota, Florida. Welcome to the show, First Lieutenant Charlie Curtis. How you doing, brother? Gentlemen, it's good to be here. I appreciate it. So Matthew is literally halfway around the world joining us yeah. in the studio today. So tell our listeners where you are and what you're doing now and what you do in the Marine Corps, please. We are recording right now here at 4.45 in the morning. Mm -hmm. It is uh, it's good, bright, and early for me here in Darwin, Australia, which is the northern part of Australia. I am part of uh, MRF-D, which is Marine Rotational Force Darwin, uh, a great program the Marine Corps runs work, working with our ADF partners and establishing a key force posture in, uh, in this region. Uh, it's been an excellent seven-month deployment here coming up on the end, and uh, I've enjoyed every minute of my real first experience out here. Now, Charlie, tell us what you're doing down there in Sarasota. So it's called the Recruiting Operations Officer. Mm -hmm. And it's really a new position designed to, with the intent at least, to bolster um, company operations and increase that community relation aspect. Mm -hmm. My guidance has mostly been add value, add grease to the tracks, and uh, make sure that we're being projected in a positive light. So I'm really happy to have the opportunity to kind of be the cutting edge of what this position can be. And I think it can be a, a great opportunity to bolster our recruiting, which I think is what we're going to talk about today, right? Oh, yeah. That's what we're going to talk about. Thank you for getting us back on track. So <laughs> you, you're also an AUSA young professional. That's true, sir. What's that? Well, sir, uh, I just discovered uh, what it might be a couple months ago. Okay. Kind of got a, a fluke text from a buddy of mine when I was stationed in Italy. And he said, hey, we're looking for some young folks to, to join the AUSA National Conference there in D.C. Nice. And so uh, I said, hey, I'm interested. I'll actually be on PCS leave uh, during that time. And I would love to, to go see what it's all about. And uh, he connected me with one of his friends from West Point who connected me with the program. And the rest is history. Now, Matt, even before you enlisted in the Marine Corps, you had another career. So you went to business school, got your MBA. And you were working mergers and acquisitions. What caused you to have this desire to serve? Yeah, that's a good question. So I, I knew I had this desire. I wanted to do this, but I had very strong opportunities. And I think this happens with a lot of Gen Zers. They had the urge to maybe look at military service. It was something of interest in high school, maybe. But then some other factor pulled them away during their life. For me, I had an amazing opportunity to do the degree program, had an amazing job that I sort of didn't want to say no to and was able to do that. And then I joined later. Luckily, I had great mentors at that job who a lot of them were veterans, who told me about the path and kept me sort of focused uh, on the path. But had I not had that, I too would have been another you know person that said, hey, I was interested in serving, but life never allowed me to do it. Now, Charlie, how about you? Let's be honest. Before you came to your senses and joined the Army, what originally made you go towards the Marines? Well, sir, uh, you know, I was born and raised in San Diego, uh, California. So when I did end up finding myself at Marine Corps Recruiting Depot San Diego, I could see where I spent prom night from Chow Hall. Really? That's how close I was. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're from San Diego, you have to join the Marine Corps. It's like a thing. No, you yeah. don't. You're supposed to join the Navy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Or the Navy, I guess. Okay, well, you do, right. you do. Well, the Marines don't say it that way, but you do join the Navy when you join the Marine yeah, Corps. Yeah, you're right. That's right. You're right. That's right. You're right. 
Technically, yes, I remember. That's correct. And yeah, I mean, I had helicopters and, you know, planes fly over my house every day. And uh, I also had a family uh, that like the, that served, both my grandparents served in the Navy, really had representation from all branches. Um, the Marine Corps was, was right there. And actually, my, my best friend in high school is a year above me, a year older than me. He joined. So I got to see him go through the entire delayed entry program process. And I followed uh, right behind him in joining as well. You know, I just knew that I wanted to wear the nation's uniform and I didn't know what was going to happen, you know, in college because I didn't really know what college looked like. And so I joined the reserves. So that way, at a minimum, I could at least wear the uniform and, uh, and serve. So did you have family in the military before you joined? I did, sir. Yes. Uh, yeah. So both my grandparents or okay. grand grandfathers and then uh -huh. one of my grandmothers as well. Really? Uh, mm -hmm. What did your grandmother do? She was a head nurse at the uh, Oakland Naval Medical Center, and that's how she met my grandpa. Wow, that's got to be a great story in itself. It really, really is. Um, and during uh, the involuntary extension of Vietnam, my grandpa got involuntary extended for three months, and it was in that three-month extension where he met her. So without that, I probably wouldn't be here. Wow. And now, Matt, you offered the book, We Don't Want You, Uncle Sam. Now, I got to admit, that is an extremely catchy title. What compelled you to write this book? I kept hearing about this recruiting crisis with my generation. So Gen Z, Pew Research, broadly defines anyone born between 1998 and 2012. And yes, I'm not 15 general, but I am 25. Um, and so... Yeah, you look like you're about 15 now. Absolutely. <laughs> that, that means so, you're living right. You're doing good PT in the morning. Exactly, Gerald. So, so what happened, I kept seeing, and we all kept seeing on the news, this recruiting crisis, this military recruiting crisis that was going on for a couple of years now. I kept seeing generals and admirals brought onto the news stations. But I kept thinking, this is a problem that resides in the youth. It resides in Gen Z, right? I can't talk about tactics and strategy like you guys, but I can talk about what's on my Instagram feed or my peers' social media a little bit more uh, astutely than than a person that was recruited 30 years ago, or I don't want to put any age, you know, 20 to 30 years ago. So I felt like I had to give my generation's voice and a very tactical ground level view on what the service branches are missing from the conversation. Right? I, I wanted to explain what really is going on in high schools and online social media, why people are maybe not joining in this modern era and what we could potentially do about it. Okay, that's good. What would you say out of those 21 recommendations is the most controversial one? There's a lot, General. So I'll, I'll, I'll caveat with that. The book is constructive and not destructive. It's easy to just throw up your hands and say, oh, this is so bad to do this, this. That's not the goal. The goal is simply to start a conversation and and be able to actually provide solutions. As we all learn in the military, you don't just provide problems, you provide solutions. There are a few key controversial ones that have generated a lot of talk online. So one of them is um, performance-based pay. Yeah. Actually paying for superior performance whether at the squad, individual, even battalion level, right? Having part of military pay, which is standard across rank, actually be maybe 10%, what we can discuss it, but be based on superior performance. That's, that's one. Uh, another very controversial one is the alcohol marijuana debate. Uh, my point being that our generation doesn't really differentiate between the two. It looks at, I'm not advocating for either of them, Mm -hmm. We don't really differentiate between the two, whereas the military strongly does, right? It's almost acceptable to drink beer on a Friday after, you know, libo, but one marijuana urine test and you're potentially kicked out of the service. So that's okay. So far, yeah, those are the two probably most controversial. A lot of them are less controversial, more thought provoking. Though, okay. I'd say. Hey, hey, so Dan, you know, you, you and I, brother, we probably would get paid a lot more money if, if they would have paid us based off how hard we work. What do you think? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I would I would increase the national deficit by at least another trillion. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. So, so, Matt, tell us, man, what was the most surprising thing you learned about Generation Z? And, oh, and by the way, you're barely in Gen Z. Barely. 
It's a good point you bring up, right? Because is there truly a difference, a Gen Z from a millennial? And my argument is no, a 1997 to 1998 person isn't like a stark difference. But once right. you start getting five years, my, my younger brother is six years younger. He's, he's very different. Yeah. So Gen Z, I like to say, we don't remember 9-11, really the first generation that that didn't impact. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, our three big events were the great financial crisis, mm -hmm. the 2016 election, regardless of whichever political party or side, we saw a very intense election. And then the COVID pandemic that actually impacted our education. Mm -hmm. If you ask the most interesting point about Gen Z uh, is that we are more resilient than we're giving credit for. We're, we're looked at I think still in some of the millennial tropes, like where the everyone gets a trophy generation, I actually found we're a very competitive generation. Okay. Can you give us an example of how Gen Z is so competitive? Absolutely. So millennials get that everyone gets a trophy, everyone, you know, shows up, participation, the soccer game, whatever. Gen Z, because we grew up with the iPhone and social media in hand, the second that you make a post, you get a certain amount of likes. Your friend gets a certain amount of likes. And even if you're not consciously competing, you know, hey, John got six more likes than me. Oh, I got to do this in my next post. Or this video is going to get more followers than this video. And so there is this sort of social score, if you can call it that, of, hey, you know, he did this or she did this. How do I, you know, compete on that level? So we have this intuitive competition drive just in our social interactions that I think is spilling over into certain. Uh, work interactions. It's always easy for older generations to look. You see this in all literature. Oh, the new generation is soft and isn't working hard. And I think the actual data will show Gen Z is competitive and, and we will work hard if given the right opportunity. Did you know, as a member of AUSA, you have access to many benefits. From car rental to entertainment discounts, the opportunities are ample. Visit AUSA.org slash benefits to learn more. Is there a member of the Army or extended Army family that's made a special impact on your life? Would you like to thank them publicly? We're airing an upcoming episode we're calling our Shout Out Special, in which listeners have the opportunity to share stories of how someone has aided them along the way and let them know the impact they've had. Yo, this is J.M.F. I'm giving a shout out to all the special forces, the operators, the commanders, the boys and the girls that have fallen beside me. All right? Hoorah! Over and out. If you'd like to give a shout out to someone, please call us and leave a message on our HUA hotline at 703-236-2914 or send us a note to podcast at AUSA.org. That's 703-236-2914 or podcast at AUSA.org. HUA. Welcome back to Army Matters. Now, Matt, I'd love to dig into some of the specifics of your book. You highlight that the Army identifies three gaps when persuading Gen Z to join. Identity, knowledge, and trust. Can you break those down for us? Absolutely. So knowledge is the one where we're struggling because we don't have enough understanding of what the military is in society. When we had 10 million people in the military in World War II, everyone knew someone who served, your uncle, father. It was, it was easy to get you know, exposure. Now, frankly, Gen Z is very busy on their phones. They have a lot of stream coming in from a lot of different content creators. And it's hard to actually focus and say, okay, the military does this, this, and this. So there's a real knowledge gap about what life and service is, uh, what you actually do. The identity gap goes with, does Gen Zer today see themselves putting away all their social media for X amount of weeks at boot camp and putting on a uniform and doing various jobs in uniform. And I think one of the issues that we're struggling with is does Gen Z identify with military jobs? Do military jobs, even if they're always going to be a little bit different, can they be some, can at least some of them be brought in line with what Gen Z expects for the modern civilian workplace? 
So that's sort of the the identity gap. And then frankly, the third one, probably one of the most important, is the trust gap. If you look at polling, trust in a lot of American institutions, unfortunately, are down. The military still polls as the highest, most trustworthy institution we have, which is which is positive. But on average, it's still down compared to highs of where it was, where it used to reach like 80%. Uh, trust, et cetera, and polling. Now you're hitting 50, 60 percent based on various polls. So that's that that presents a problem, right? Whereas majority of society still obviously trusts the military and believes in it in many ways. Young Gen Zers are starting to question the transparency practices. We know exactly when we're being sold to. Our minds are so tuned. Again, going back to social media, think of how Amazon ads are popping up, like on your phone, if you talk about. Uh, chicken, chicken will pop up as an ad. We know how marketers are reaching us and selling to us. And so I think transparency is a really, I don't want to say lost art, but it's a really highly valued concept nowadays. And Gen Zers will appreciate if recruiters or anyone, frankly, will look at them and say, hey, you're going to get this benefit and you're going to have this struggle. This is how it's really going to be. There's going to be days where you don't love this, this, and this, but you're still going to gain this, this, and this. And Again, going back to my experience, the veterans I spoke to were very honest about that. It was very clear to me the goods and the bads that I was getting into. And that made me reassured, hey, I'm still making the decision on my own volition, not, oh, I was tricked and now you know life is nothing like what it was sold to me. So I think that transparency factor is really important in this discussion. That's very good. Matt, let me ask you a question too, because you know, I ran recruiting for five years and then I was the Sergeant Major of the Army for another five um, and when I would go out and talk to recruiters until this day, the number one answer I get from every single recruiter is that when they talk to a young man, 18 to 24 year old in this country, they are inspired to do one thing after high school, and that's go to college. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, we, we have definitely had a culture that college is the way of advancement and that uh, it, it's a key thing to do. And, and frankly, I've talked to a lot of service members, you know, their parents are, are pushing them, hey, really want you to go to college because it's the best outcome for you. A few things about Gen Z. One, for the first time in, in decades, we're seeing slightly a pushback on that. We're seeing a, a rise of blue collar jobs supported that don't need college. And we're seeing certain colleges and certain degrees, frankly, openly put into question uh, by our generation. So a, I think the, the sands could be shifting there. That being said, is education super important? Even if Gen Z is relooking various parts of the college model, is education super important? Is there a strong thing to be said about the quote-unquote value of a degree? Absolutely. And one of the parts of the book that I mentioned, you know, if you're in the military for X amount of time, you should be mandated to take certain education courses. We, we do this already with military PME, but because we want that dual civilian full concept, I think it's important that we, we do a, a better job of, of showing, hey, if they did these military classes, those count for college credits. And there are good programs working on doing that. But B, if you're in for a various amount of time, you should be sort of encouraged, if not mandated, to be working also in concurrently towards a degree. Now, Charlie, one of Matt's recommendations in his book is to reduce the length of contracts. What do you think about that? I think it's a great idea. Truthfully, when I was looking at, you know, going into the army, I knew that, you know, there were different officer paths. You know, if you uh, attend the academy, it's five years. If you do ROTC, it's four years. If you do OCS, it's three years um, post-commission. Wow. That's right. Dan, did you know that? That they... Uh, it was only three years. I didn't realize that. Mm -hmm. OC, Officer Canada School, because I OCS. guess a little more season. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Cool. Because typically the army has not, well, not typically the army has not paid for your degree. So the commitment's not there. Same as ROTC right. or the yep. military Academy. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, I didn't go into it with the intent of, you know, three years and, and, and leaving, but it being three years and having that shorter obligation, I did add for some flexibility, which, you know, I can't deny wasn't at least another drop in the bucket of attractiveness. Yeah. So the reason why I said that is because I was a two year guy oh, wow. when I enlisted in the army. Right. And, uh, okay. which led to a 30, uh, 30 year career. And I would have stayed if they hadn't kicked me out. So Dan, but, uh, yeah. how long ago was that? Uh, that was 1989. Right, but, right, but, right. Yeah. Yeah. So wait, but hold on, <laughs> hold on, hold on. So when we were sitting in there, because even when I was yesterday, we saw this, even though I, I like to 
proudly say I made mission every year. I was the Sergeant Major of the Army. So, um, but uh, Secretary did you Esper, make mission? Okay, we did, we did, okay. we did, we made the mission. Army did. Well, I know, but you know what's crazy is the army did it when it all goes well. But yeah, when I something's know. wrong, it's my fault, right? That's I know. right. It's all good. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. But Secretary Esper sat at the table and I said, Hey, we, we need to reduce contracts to two year yeah. options. He goes, Why would yeah. we do that? You know, we're training people that are going to leave the army. Actually, if you go back and look in history, they have a higher retention rate than any other service contract. Really? Yes. Once so they get the, the taste. The lower, the lower the initial contract, the higher the re, the reenlistment rate. Okay. Yes. Good. And that probably still today. I, of course, I don't have access to all that data anymore. Right. Right. But uh, but I agree with you 100. percent And that's not even a Gen Z thing. That is every generation. Um, so every time we've done that throughout the history of the Army, it translated into higher retention rates. Yeah. Now earlier you mentioned, you know, the similarity between alcohol and marijuana and the difference of uh, previous generations to Generation Zers. Can you elaborate on that? You know, what's your recommendation about marijuana usage um, that you describe in the book? Absolutely. So I'm never going to advocate for the use of, frankly, either substance. It doesn't make us more lethal yeah. war fighters, right? They're both probably destructive to one's health substances. No, no. I, I think our listeners though, understand what you're saying. Yeah, you're exactly. Right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my, my, my big point, though, is, hey, listen, alcohol, beers, they've been a part of our culture. Like, they're encouraged. Get beers with the squad after, uh, you know, Friday Liberal Brief, right? But like I said, marijuana, one positive urine test and you can be kicked out. There's such a, I don't want to say lingering Vietnam War era concept around it where like marijuana is this evil, evil drug and it's this gateway to everything. And frankly, the generation that I'm in doesn't look at it like that. Yeah. I spoke to many Gen Zers that have said, hey, if I could smoke weed on the weekend, I potentially be interested in joining the military or, you know there's a lot of that sentiment running around and i think that would be a interesting step it doesn't have to be total like hey we're, we're going to turn a blind eye to it but i think we can take steps in the right direction uh, and, and quote unquote give way on this issue without lowering the standard i'm a big believer we should never be lowering the standard i don't know that this is necessarily lowering the standard of our service members yeah yeah so so matt you know and and one of the topics um we talk about the importance of climate change, but some Gen Zers don't associate the military as playing a role in the in the battle. So, you know, even where you are today, what would Matthew recommend the Army do and the Marine Corps do to counter this? Because, you know, where you are today, you're you just can't blow up anything. You got to take care of the environment. Regardless of where you fall in the political spectrum or what you maybe believe around climate change, there's no question that the environment is a key factor in warfare. We studied that in military intelligence. Gen Z very much cares about the future of the earth and the actual health of the environment. Mm-hmm. The biggest organization in the world is the U.S. military, right? So it's not associated that we are also the biggest impact on the environment, the biggest both positive or negative, depending on how we act. I spoke to this great engineer once who didn't truly necessarily think so much about the military mission, but he wanted to serve because he knew the biggest impact he could have on the environment was making a few small changes in the engineering core in, in the military. And I think if we emphasize that for all these Gen Zers that really want to do things in the environment, the way that, frankly, we're going to be the best, most lethal warfighters is be able to use all of our Navy ports, use all of these uh, host nation countries and bases that are uh, protecting the environment. Frankly, there could be wars in the future that are fought over environmental abuse, environmental uh, uh, factors for, you know, water, et cetera. So yeah. I think it's important that we associate those two. Gen Z realizes, hey, I could have a huge impact on the environment in the military. Okay, good. Sounds like he should be uh, running for office or something, Dan. What do you think? <laughs> well, we need him in the military first. <laughs> yeah, we do. We, yeah, yeah, we he's do. Got, and he's, he's got a lot know, of things to do. Like you said, he's too young. We don't want him to yeah. go into that, that field yet. Yeah. Now, now, Charlie, you're going to be on the front lines every day recruiting America's finest, discussing and dealing with a lot of the things that we've just been talking about. Now, what can we do as veterans or or anyone listening do to help you out? I would say uh, be a champion for the Army, be a champion for the military, be a champion for your service. No matter how much time you've served, it's affected you in, in some way um, and it's altered your life trajectory. So talk about how it helped you and how it got you to where you are today. I mean, I definitely did not expect myself to be 
in Sarasota, Florida as a first lieutenant helping recruiting even a year ago. And it's awesome. That's what's, that's what's part of the adventure. Um, I definitely didn't expect to be jumping out of good airplanes, you know, right there by the Alps in Vicenza. You know, that's a heck of an experience. I've had a lot of awesome experiences just by seeking them out and finding them and moving forward to them. And uh, I would say if folks can share their story and how they did the same, then uh, they're naturally going to uh, inspire the next generation. You know what? That's the reason why we do this podcast, Charlie. Now, Matt, how can our listeners get a copy of your book? Absolutely. Uh, we don't want your Uncle Sam. It's available in three formats on, on Amazon, just typing in We Don't Want Your Uncle Sam by Matthew Weiss. It's, uh, the book website is unclesambook.org. I appreciate, obviously, all the support. It's uh, been a wild ride uh, launching this thing, but it's been uh, a stimulant for really great dinner table conversations, and, that, and that's been the goal. So that's been positive. Okay, that's good. Okay, okay. But what's honestly harder? Matt, is it boot camp or <laughs> self-publishing a book like this? It's, it's, a, it's a great question. Uh, OCS boot camp, I definitely would still say it was just such a life-changing experience. Here I was, this this fancy Wharton MBA with a good job, and I was being screamed at because I couldn't open a, a padlock on time. I, <laughs> I just felt extremely worthless in that moment. But from that, that breaking down, right, I, I was able to build back up. Can you open the padlock on time now? Uh, it's still, still to this day, I, I don't know if I could do it in the time they wanted me to. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, you may not have mastered the padlock, <laughs> but you've definitely been able to create a thought-provoking book. So Matt, Charlie, thank you both for your incredible service and for coming on to the show today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, it's my pleasure, gentlemen. Seriously, quite, a, quite an honor and a privilege. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. It's an honor. Thank you for everything you've done for our country. Uh, we have a big legacy and big shoes to fill, but uh, I promise you, I, I do believe Gen Z will fill them. Semper Fi, Marie. Right to that. Every generation does, bro. Exactly. Rod General. In today's episode, Matthew Weiss discussed three gaps that are inhibiting recruitment, identity, knowledge, and trust. These will be further discussed in an upcoming AUSA Spotlight paper entitled Be All You Can Be, The U.S. Army's Recruiting Transformation, which frames the Army's recruiting shortfall in the national context. Look for it in early 2024. And finally, we put out the word last month asking for listeners to call or email us a shout out to someone in the Army or Army family who has helped them along the way. If you'd like to give a shout out to someone, Leave us a voicemail at 703-236-2914 or email a voice note to podcast at ausa.org. To all our listeners, thanks for joining us. Army Matters is brought to you by the Association of the United States Army, the U.S. Army's Professional Association, member-supported, Army-connected. Visit us at ausa.org for more information or to become a member. Your membership helps AUSA continue to carry out its mission, educate, inform, and connect with the total Army, our industry partners, and supporters of a strong national defense. Today's episode was hosted by Lieutenant General Retired Les Smith and SMA Retired Dan Daly, an anchor hosted by Carrie Barrow Heckes. Anthony Del Call is the producer and writer, and Andy Bosnack is the supervising sound editor. Ellen Toner is the content editor. Unzinga Curry is the executive producer, and the senior producers are Carrie Barrow-Heckes and LaSharon Duncan. Be sure to subscribe to Army Matters wherever you get your podcasts, and please leave a review. As you know, we love seeing stars in the Army, especially if it comes in the form of a five-star review. AUSA's Army Matters podcast can also be heard on Reese Across America Radio on Monday at 8 p.m. Eastern on the iHeartRadio app, the Odyssey app, and the TuneIn app with the search of the word Reef. AUSA's Army Matters podcast primary purpose is to entertain. The podcast does not constitute advice or services. While guests are invited to listen, Listeners, please note that you're not being provided professional advice from the podcast or the guests. The views and opinions of our guests do not necessarily reflect the views of AUSA. 
For questions or to provide topic recommendations, email us at podcast at AUSA.org. I'm with Sharon Duncan. Hope you have a great Army day. Hua.